So hi everyone, my name is Samin. Um, I am originally from Bangladesh, but I grew up in Toronto, Canada. I work on artificial intelligence from the perspective of uh, designing things that are good for good for humanity. Um, and I work on research in, in some of these areas as well. Um, so uh, my prior experience, I developed this robotic arm that was used for arm amputees um, as a cheaper alternative to costly robotic arms. Uh, this is called Smart Arm. In 2018, we won Microsoft's Global Innovation Competition um, for, for this project. Um, in addition to that, I work on research at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. We're exploring how to analyze people's language use um, to understand their mental health better. Um, and, and, and through that research, I founded a company called Animo, which is um, applying this technology to try to service people with their, with their mental health. So today I'll be speaking about uh, just providing an intro to artificial intelligence, um, really, really basic introduction. And then I'll talk about how I've thought about designing um, technology for people through, the, through empathy using, using artificial intelligence. Uh, anything else I should mention, Mupasim, or should I get started? It's great. Cool. I'll just share my screen here. Can you see everything okay? Perfect. Amazing. So overview, first we'll just talk about what AI is uh, more generally. I'll go through a few examples. We'll I'll talk about why we should design AI with empathy and, and provide a framework for how to do that. Um, and, and talk about some examples uh, that I've, I've done within, within my own work. So the first thing is, what is artificial intelligence? People think artificial intelligence is like robots that are going to be just like humans um, and, and will maybe take over the world or something like that. Um, the way we think about artificial intelligence uh, mainly now is between artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence. And um, narrow intelligence, we can think about applications of artificial intelligence that are specific to some sort of task. So for example, um, on your iPhone, you have Siri that you can use for specific things on your phone, like playing music, checking the weather, simple commands that your phone already does to provide you information. Um, and so it's very specific for that kind of thing. Same with Google, Google Homes or Amazon's Alexa. And um, some other applications are even within social media. So with Instagram, for example, um, when you are in the Explore tab and you're seeing new pictures and posts, um, that's artificial narrow intelligence because they are trying to um, provide you the picture that they think that you will uh, want to look at the most, want to click and, and like the most. Um, so this is a very specific task, but that is actually artificial intelligence that is running um, those platforms. On the other hand, there's artificial general intelligence, and that's kind of what a lot of people think about uh, artificial intelligence more broadly. It's that it's capable of doing things very generally, just like humans are. Um, so, you know, there are movies like The Terminator or in Star Wars, if those, those robots um, that act just like humans can understand emotions. Um, the, these are sort of capable of, of a whole bunch of things that we as humans can also do. Um, so for, for this talk, we'll be sp specifically focusing on artificial narrow intelligence. Um, general intelligence is a, is a much sort of bigger um, problem and um, may, maybe we'll, we'll chat about that again um, uh, some other time. Um, so as I mentioned, there's there the examples with narrow, narrow AI around Google search, Amazon, um, Alexa, and, and Apple Siri. So one, one thing to maybe, maybe think about, um, one way to break down if something actually is artificial neurointelligence, because there's so many things um, that we use we don't realize are actual examples of artificial intelligence. 
um, narrow intelligence specifically. One way to think about that is any sort of time you're interacting with technology, you could think about what is the input, what is the output, and is there a sort of prediction task that is going on? So one way that people talk about artificial intelligence is that it's a system that is looking at previous data and then taking some input and then making some prediction about it. So, and, and all of these sort of prediction tasks are sort of meant to model what a human being also does. So for instance, with me, when I am sitting here, like I have a glass of water, I need to drink water in order to survive. When I first see this, see this glass sitting on the table, I'll process the data with my, with my eyes and I will think what, how is, what is the best way to, to pick this up? And maybe we don't think about this, but our brain, our muscles, our body will automatically do this. And what's happening is our brain is making a prediction that based on the shape of this glass, the best way to hold it is like this, using this kind of grip. So I make a prediction and I do this. Similarly with robots that are being trained um, to do things like pick up objects, it's a similar sort of system where they're trying to make a prediction based on the shape that they see, based on the, the data that they're getting visually. One example that is most common that we don't think about is Google's search engine, which I'm sure many, many, um, everybody uses. Um, so when you think about it, the input there is instead of it being visual, like, like it is for me picking up a glass, the input is going to be text. So you might type in, um, you know, how, how big is the big is the earth? And then when you look at the output, as you can see on the slides, you'll see a bunch of links come up. And the output is actually the order and type of link that's that that's put. There's Google specifically puts links in, in, in that order. And what they're trying to do is find you the answer to your question or the most relevant website to what you searched to help you find what you're looking for. So in this case, it's a prediction task that they're doing. They're trying to help you find, predict what is the best answer for your question or what is the most relevant website for what you are searching for. Similarly with, uh, and again, this is sort of modeling what humans do. When if I'm to ask, uh, you know, move to seem, what is the best restaurant on, on, uh, by the University of Toronto? He's going to maybe think about a few that come to mind that are top, top, the top three maybe, and then think about, okay, what was the tastiest? Maybe what is the cheapest? And then he'll tell me what the top three are. And, and um, so, sorry? The brown truck. <laughs> the brown food truck. Um, so similarly, just like that, he is um, operating like a Google search engine and making a prediction task based on input of what I'm telling him and, and, and putting that out. So artificial intelligence, just like this example with Google search engine, is trying to do something that humans are doing, um, but doing it through, through um, computers. So um, one thing that might be good to think about, so if you're watching this talk, I'd recommend um, pausing it at the end of this. Um, think about one example of, of AI um, in your life that you might not have, have realized. Um, so, so think about different kinds of technology that you interact with, maybe apps on your phone or websites that you visit. Think about where, where there is data being input, what is being output, and maybe in between that input and output, is there some sort of prediction task going on? And that prediction task will be based on that artificial intelligence that's trying to find patterns and relationships between information. So feel free to pause here and maybe come uh, think of an example um, and maybe share, share that with a, with, a, with a friend and then you can Google it and maybe, maybe, maybe your example is using artificial intelligence. So next up, um, that was a, just a brief introduction around what AI is and how you should think about um, think about it in the real world. The, the next part of this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, design thinking. So design thinking is a framework for how to go about designing new, new ideas to, to, to problems. And 
it's a framework that I try to apply with any of my startups that I've run. And it's a good way to drive creative new solutions through empathy. Um, and I'll go, go through specific examples of using this framework for artificial intelligence. So the main idea is um, you'd want to first figure out some sort of uh, um, problem that someone is facing, and that's going to start with empathy. So what is what is a problem that some somebody is going through? Um, whether that's accessing information. So like with Google, people they they felt like it's hard to um, organize all of the information on on online into an easy way, and so they felt like people could could benefit maybe from having an easier way to access information. So it, that is one example that started off with empathy. Um, and then you would go to clearly defining the problem. So again, with Google's example, um, it would be getting people the right information um, when they want to search it up. And then you would go through ideating. So it's like generating some ideas. So maybe in their case, they're like, okay, maybe we'll write a website. Um, and it has a, you know, a search bar and someone can type something in on their keyboard. And then you prototype. So maybe you get a, a developer or you maybe make a mock-up. Maybe you just draw it on a whiteboard or a sheet of paper just to come up with an idea of what it's gonna look like. And so they decide, okay, we're gonna put the search bar in the middle of the screen and it's just gonna have uh, a button that says search. And then um, you wanna test it. And so that would mean putting it actually in front of people and uh, allowing them to use it and then seeing does it, does it actually solve their problem? And then that goes back to empathy. Um, so now you're, you're talking to the person again and you're seeing does this actually solve the problem? So that's the framework. We're gonna walk through um, one example. So um, for instance, I have a, a friend of mine, her name is Annalisa and she is a congenital arm amputee. So she was born um, with, without her left, left hand. And so you can see just her uh, residual limb on her left arm. And so when speaking to her uh, as, an, as an amputee, it's difficult to uh, pick up objects, picking up a glass suddenly is, is, not, is not possible. So this is obviously a, a difficult problem. When I spoke to her, um, and again, this is thinking about the empathy, um, she, she explained the situation she was going through and she helped me define the problem, which is the next step, step two. So she said that the prosthetic that she has right now, it's very simple. There are no electronics, but it costs $900. So you can see on her arm, there's sort of this uh, brown prosthetic uh, that's just slipped over. And she showed me how it works. It, it's expensive, it's $900. All she can do is she can take her phone and, and slip it between the prosthetic and her residual limb. So it's not uh, it's not it's not very effective for doing doing too much. So um, when I started to understand and define the problem a little bit more, it felt like there were prosthetics that were being used that were that cost money and didn't really help her interact, like use her arm in a way that could pick up things and um, operate just like just like I could with my with my hands. So. In defining the problem, um, it looked like there are actually some robotic arms that are out there, but they're really, really, really expensive. So arms that could, you know, pick up pick up a glass, but are very expensive, and usually they're they're only um, powered by shoulder joints, and um, they they do provide increased functionality, but again, they can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So getting a bit more into defining the problem before, before we start to get into the third phase, which is the idea. When we think about this, um, when, when somebody does get a robotic arm because they're maybe born with an amputation or they got into an accident and now they're missing an arm, the reasons why it's really expensive, and, and maybe you can also pause here and try to think like, why, why are robotic arms so expensive? What is the main reason? that makes them uh, difficult for, for amputees to purchase. The reasons that we identified when we were defining the problem a little bit more was that 
each case of arm amputation is really different. So maybe you're born uh, without it, or maybe you get into an accident. Maybe you, you lose your limb up here, maybe it's down here, maybe it's above your uh, elbow. So what does that mean? That means the nerves are going to be damaged in different places, and it might require neurosurgeons to get involved and to implant nerves in those places. So it's really expensive getting doctors involved. You also might need therapy for a long time. So that means someone that's helping you stretch your arm and build those muscles. And so because of that, it gets really expensive because each case is so unique and it needs the amputee's residual arm to still send the signals to the robotic arm through this, uh, this technology called myoelectrics, um, where the computer can pick up on if you're flexing a muscle and then it can trigger like a robotic arm to move. So one idea for solving this problem is, as I mentioned before, when we think about me picking up this glass, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the glass through, through my eyes and I'm sort of seeing that it's a sort of this round shape. And because it's this round shape, I know I have to make my arms curved so that it can pick it up just like this. I can't, I can't, I can't pick it up like this. I can't, I can't pick it up like this. I need to curve it around based on the shape. So thinking about how I do that as a human being, you might be able to use my own human intelligence to model artificial intelligence to do the same thing. So um, the idea, and then this went into a prototype very quickly, but the idea started off with, if we put a camera onto the, onto the arm, and we hook up the camera to a small computer um, that would be just located above the arm. There are small computers called Raspberry Pis. They're like this big. And through that computer, we would detect the camera feed. So you get video data, just like my eyes are collecting data, or just like you, which you're watching this video, your eyes are collecting um, data through the, through the screen. We would have the Raspberry Pi with an artificial intelligence um, algorithm on it, a machine learning classifier that looked at other objects. We had a big data set where we trained the, the model. And what that did was when it saw another object, it would, it would, it would be able to pick it up like a glass. So now when, it, when the arm sees through the camera, it's going to change the motors so that it could pick it up. So that is one application of machine learning that we'd uh, uh, I developed and prototyped from thinking about Annalisa from an empathy-driven perspective. And we defined the problem very clearly. Why are our robotic arms so expensive? It's because each case is unique and you need neurosurgeons and, and therapists to get involved. But if we look at just how humans process it, there might be a way we can make it a lot cheaper by having the arm take care of all of the grabbing rather than relying on the nerves of the amputee. So after prototyping it, um, we tried, so then we went back to Annalisa and we, we wanted to test it. So I don't know if the video here would work, but um, we basically had her try it on. Right now it's on her uh, right arm, um, but we were having her test it out. And then from there we kept going. So we, we realized that it was a little bit too heavy. So we had to think about how do we make the materials lighter? And you kind of keep going through that design thinking cycle, and then you'll be able to uh, develop um, a product that will hopefully be valuable. Um, so, so that's kind of the design thinking framework. So yeah, so I'll, that, that, that was the example that I wanted to paint with, with, um, with SmartArm. I'll go back to the design thinking framework really quickly. So again, this, this is like a, a, a great way to think about problems that people face and then ways that you can apply solutions. The example that I gave was specifically thinking about um, when we went to the empathy define, I thought about it from the perspective of my intelligence as a human being, um, but sometimes that won't be required. So sometimes artificial intelligence, machine learning is not the right solution. Um, but this design thinking framework, you can apply for any area where you want to do work, um, whether it's technology or otherwise. 
um, when you're thinking about how to solve problems for people, um, which everyone should be thinking about with whatever they want to do with their education or career or work, um, we want to be helping helping society solve solve problems. And if we start from a place of empathy and then define ideate prototype and test, we can we can do, uh, be much clearer around around problem solving and think about how technology fits into that. But really starting off with the human being first. Um, that, that that's very important. So that concludes my presentation. Um, and I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Sarvin. That was awesome. I have a bunch of questions for you. Yeah. First of all, how would you define empathy? Like your definition of empathy? Yeah. So my definition of empathy is that it's it's kind of like a, a skill that 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 we have. And that skill is our ability to look at the world through someone else's perspective and feel what they're feeling. So in the case of, uh, of Annalisa, it's empathy, empathy was going to her house. Um, it was talking to her parents and it was talking to her about the problems that she faces as an arm amputee. Um, and so from, from those conversations, it kind of helps build that skill of empathy. I mean, and, and I think empathy, it, it takes time. You need to, uh, people, people can get better at empathy by talking more with others that are maybe um, going through a difficult time and looking at things from their, their perspective. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's kind of my first thoughts about empathy, specifically with how we're thinking about it right now. Awesome. Uh, the design framework you actually showed, I'm just wondering uh, how much time do you personally devote on each of the phases? Because what I noticed is that defining problem and talking to people seemed more important than actually the other steps to me. I'm not sure if that's how you feel. Yeah, great question. How much time to spend on each steps and, and your hunches maybe empathy and define the problem. Um, yeah. Ideally, you want to take as little time as possible um, and, and, and you want to just go around the loop and keep testing. Um, but um, first, I think relative to the others, I think your, your hunch is right spending more time on empathy and the problem. Because a lot of times when we're looking at especially technology, people just want to use technology for the sake of it. And we end up building apps and products and software and hardware that aren't actually helpful for people because it's not solving a real problem. So making sure that you actually have a problem that somebody is experiencing is important first and foremost. So I would spend a little bit more time on empathy and defining the problem. And then when you get to, um, and, 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 and just to say like these, especially if this is like an idea you're just thinking about, I mean, it's hard to say how many days or weeks to spend on it, but some of the empathy and define those should come, or at least the empathy should come, you know, naturally as human beings, we want to understand the problems of the people around us. So maybe this will be weeks, months, years. Um, with, with my mental health startup, my younger sister, as she's really struggling with her mental health. And for me, it was understanding that over years and years, and then thinking about the problem a little bit more um, that got me into the, the project that I'm working on now. So maybe, maybe that will take long. But once you kind of get into the flow of it, you want to idea, you don't want to take weeks and months to, to come up with a prototype and test it. The um, ideate prototype and test phase should be very quickly. Um, especially if, if, if this is like a, a, a startup um, or, or some um, technical project that you want to work on, um, those things should happen very quickly. I would say on the scale of days to a week or two weeks. Um, and even, even if you don't have a lot of the resources, like maybe you don't, you're not that good of a developer, maybe you don't know many developers, but you need to develop some sort of software for to test radio. Start off with a mock-up. Make, make a mock-up on a piece of paper and then show it to your friends. That's testing it. That is one way of testing your, your idea by just showing if they would use this. Um, and start with the smallest possible thing and then keep going from there. Does it make it easier if, um, if it's a problem of yours that you're trying to solve? Because I guess you can understand your problem far better than anyone else. 
Yes, I would say it's it's definitely it's a it's a best situation when you have the problem because testing will be very easy. That will that should always take the least amount of time then because when you come up with your new prototype, you can test it on yourself. You don't have to find other uh, too many other people to 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 test it on. So that is definitely ideal. But if you also find problems that other people have, that's that's not a shouldn't it shouldn't deter you from trying that as well. So by keeping the feedback time very uh, small is the key, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Right. Also, one question is that, hmm, so how do you, uh, I, I know you mentioned about that the problem solution doesn't need to be AI or any software, it could be anything else. Yeah. But like, say you're, you're studying computer, you studied computer science and then your coworkers are also in, in that domain. And then you, you all find a problem and it's natural that most of them will, will lean towards a software solution. In, in that kind of setting, how do you make sure that you're thinking more horizontally than thinking very uh, narrow in a specific domain? Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily a problem if, if you're in a group of people in software and you find a problem and everyone wants to apply a software. I mean, that's the sort of tool set that maybe you have. So it's not necessarily a problem. So if I am wanting to, if I have a problem where like, you know, let's say, let's say that painting I have back there, um, you know, a problem before was how do I hang this painting up? Um, I have to drill holes in the wall and I need, and then I need, I need to put screws in there so I can hang the, hang the painting up. Um, my, my toolbox, maybe I don't have a drill um right but maybe maybe only have like a hammer and, a, and some screws um the main problem is getting the holes in the wall and then sticking them in so maybe i just use the hammer and i put the screws in the wall instead of instead of getting a drill um whatever tool toolkit that that you do have accessible to you um if it is the software then that's that's not necessarily a problem but it, it is good to keep an open mind um uh, to to software not not being the case. So like we're going back, I mean, there's no clear solution for this, um, but spending time on the empathy and defining the problem um, very, very clearly, and then talking to the person. Uh, I think as long as you're continuously talking to the people that are facing the problem, you'll find out very quickly whether software is the right thing or, or maybe if it's, if it's not. Awesome. Also, at one point you mentioned you try to put analogy behind uh you try to draw a parallel between human mind and ai uh -huh. um, one of the key concern is that humans actually don't need that much of data that ai needs mm -hmm. right now that's right what do you think about it like what's the future of ai in, in is this it? domain is it data relied or it should be more about as Julia pearl uh preaches about causality, uh, introducing causality in AI would be the solution to AGI. Causality, I'm sorry, what do you, what do you mean by that? Causality? I mean that like, so right now what AI is currently doing is you're feeding it a tons of data and it makes a model out of that. But uh, you would expect a smart AI to in for a model just from few samples of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so as you are part of Vector Institute and you're working with the scientists from there, uh, what, what is your take on the future of AI in the next two or three years? Yeah, that's really, really difficult to say in terms of how, how AI might advance to get as good as humans on, on some tasks. So I had a conversation with a, um, with a friend, his name is Samir, uh, he's also from Bangladesh, who just completed his um, grad school in computational linguistics from the University of Toronto. And he was explaining that one, one problem that they look at in linguistics is um, human children, when they're learning a language, um, within just like three examples, they're able to learn the difference between a, just a dog and like a German shepherd, um, for example. Um, getting getting a computer to be able to tell the difference between a dog and German Shepherd might take like thousands of, of training examples, uh, whereas somehow children are able to do it with just a handful. 
Um, so that, that that is a phenomena that we uh, don't know how, how well it works based, based on my understanding from that conversation with Samir. Um, it's difficult to say how um, we, we how we will do on that in the next few years. Um, I, I really cannot say, but one thing that might be of interest uh, for, for a long time, people thought it'd be really difficult for getting a computer to even get better at recognizing images um, if provided one. So for example, if I take a picture of the street, um, getting a computer to recognize all the different things from the cars to the people, to the signs, to the trees, to the buildings. Um, but after the, the, the sort of creation of deep learning with, with Jeff Hinton and some of his co colleagues at the University of Toronto, uh, training training models on on many many examples, computers were able to outperform how well a human being is able to detect images when they're shown the picture of a street. For example, um, humans will actually make mistakes um, more more frequently than the computer will. Um, with 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 some examples, so I mean that's an example of like computers progressing faster. But the problem that you suggested around doing that just with limited data it's really hard to say um I, I wouldn't know how how that problem might be overcome and I'm, I'm not too sure what the current approaches are on that right now thanks uh one last question from my side is that Was there a question? Oh, sorry. Could you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Would you do you mind repeating the question? Yeah. How has your experience been with Animal? How has my experience been with Animal? Oh, uh, it's been yeah. absolutely incredible. It's been a roller coaster. Um, it's been there are like some weeks where things are absolutely amazing um, startup. It's a lot of fun because um, I get to be my own boss. I get to work with only the people that I want to work with. I get to work on a problem that I really care about. I get to use technology that I think is interesting. Um, so those are all like a lot of plus points and I have a lot of freedom, which is, which is really nice. Um, but then there's also weeks of time where, you know, with the startup, you're trying to develop something that is valuable for lots of people. And you're trying to develop a business that can provide some product or service that people will pay for because they think it is valuable. Um, the difficult thing is you are doing that with a lot less people, a lot less money, maybe a lot less brain power than a lot of the larger companies. So with developing any kind of, um, especially with a technology startup like Animo, um, there are questions around, well, what, why wouldn't uh, Google or Microsoft um, be able to do this um, because they have thousands of employees, they have billions of dollars. Why, why, why couldn't they just do this? And then why, why, why would it be important for you to? So, so during, during times like that, I mean, answering those questions are, are difficult with any startup. Um, so times like that, it's, it's, it's where the challenges become really apparent, those are times where it's, it's, it's especially difficult. And on the day, day to day, when um, a customer gives you feedback that it's the, the, you know, the product isn't helping them, that's really hard. Um, Cause it feels like if your product or startup is, is not, is getting rejected, then it feels like you are getting rejected because it feels like it's, it's your life's work. Uh, but at the same time, when you have um, customers or users say that your product actually really helped me, especially with Animo, when people say that it actually helped them with their mental health. It's very, very rewarding. It's incredibly rewarding. Um, so it's, it's, it's been very up and down, but um, I'm generally feel very grateful because I get to be responsible for how I learn about new technology, about business, uh, about people, um, in my own way. So I, I kind of like that ambiguity. I also, it also, it's also very creative because I have to come up with how to approach problems 
uh, when there isn't a clear solution for it. So the creativity I really enjoy as well. So yeah, last thing I wanted to mention also before, before I go, um, this design thinking um, framework was taught to me by a professor named um, Dr. Istiak Ahmed, who started the first human computer interaction lab in, in Bangladesh. Um, I would highly recommend anybody that's interested in um, design thinking or, or ethnographic research um, that's focused on identifying problems from the human centered perspective, from empathy. I would highly recommend that they look into Ishtiak Ahmed um, and, and his lab. They, they do some very, very amazing uh, work. Awesome. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? I guess we're good for today. Uh, thank you for joining us, Amin. It was a very insightful uh, workshop, especially the design thinking part and how it connects with AI and all. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you for having me. And for anyone that is uh, watching this, it'd be great to get some feedback on what you felt like you learned um, from this, what was the most valuable thing um, for you. Um, that would be helpful, helpful to know. So if you could drop it in the comments. Um, that would be great.